So welcome everyone to Poetry East. Uh, my name is Maitreya Bandhu, and we're tuning Poetry East in from the London Buddhist Centre. This isn't a, a green screen behind me, this actually exists. Here I am in the main shrine room of the London Buddhist Centre where we host Poetry East. Poetry East, the, the intention of Poetry East is to showcase creative excellence in any, any and every form. So we've had Ian McGilchrist, we've had Anthony Gormley, we've had Michael Longley, we've had Jory Graham, uh, we've had Com Tobin. You know, we, 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 we're, we're interested in excellence. We want to really um, showcase excellence and, and explore it. And I'm really excited today to have the poet and cricket, cr nearly said cricket, the poet and critic, uh, Angie Malenko. Um, she's written five books of poetry. Uh, she's also won the Randall Jarrell Award for Criticism. Um, Angie's poetry, is, it, I, I discovered, I can't remember now how I discovered her poetry. It might have been reading uh, some of her poems in the London Review of Books. But it's one of those rare experiences, at least they're rare for me, where a, a poet comes into your world whose work you're intrinsically excited by. Um, a tr yeah, I, so as soon as I, I read them and... Um, explore them. I really wanted to try and see if I could um, be in conversation with Angie. So here we are for our next, uh, for this poetry, so we're going to be exploring the poetry of Angie Malinka. She, I'm going to be talking to her about her work and she'll be reading the poems as well. So welcome Angie, really good to have you here at Poetry East. Uh, really Thank well, you. welcome. And where are you tuning in from? Uh, Gainesville, Florida. Right, okay, it's a long, long way away from Bethnal Green in London, I can tell you. Uh, yeah, really, really nice to see you. I'm really um, pleased that you can be our guest. I really, I've been really enjoyed uh, immersing myself in your, in your poetry. But let's start with a new poem um, that's recently been published. It was published in the LRB just recently, wasn't it, called Moth or Orchid. And this is going to be part in, in your new collection, Venice, which is going to be published in April next year. But I thought we'd just go straight into a poem and hear that. And then I've got lots of questions I want to ask you and uh, lots of explorations into them. But let's start with your poem, Moth Orchid. All right. Moth Orchid. I like, don't you, that it has an insect tattooed in its sanctum sanctorum, a suitor sued. That's one aspect of its ghostliness, its moon tones, its utter prescience, not to mention cojones. For if those speckles don't answer to the footprints of insects tramping through the moon dust of its pollen, I don't know what its six headdresses are for or what their iodine and moonlight tint redresses. Nor why each of those hexaheads tricks in a slightly different direction and mimics a demoiselle d'Avignon tableau, modulating to monstrousness from beauty. Or say they mimic a mother's uncanny abilities, such as vision in 360 degrees, since this was a Mother's Day gift, which required equal parts extravagance and thrift. Or say that the gift of a moth orchid to the mother from her kid encrypts something of her lonely midnight vigils, the moon in varying dosages like Advil's. Because its soft tints and moon tones combine with its etymological cojones to represent the parent who must hybridize both mother and father in her kid's eyes. That's great. Yep. Is that slow enough? <laughs> that's great. I have to remind myself of this slowly. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's really lovely. So I wanted, I mean, when I've been reading your uh, your poetry, Angie, the, you, you strike me as being the grandchild of a sort of union between Elizabeth Bishop and James uh, Merrill. Um, that, that, that was my way of thinking about you. He's still my heart. <laughs> <laughs> she, um, you know, you've got bishops, all the way through the poetry, I think you've got bishops worry about um, undue weight, you know, uh, unearned weight. You've got her compassionate humour. What was it Lowell said? Her, her something like her, yes, her sorrowing cheerfulness, uh, which very, very strong in Bishop. And I think you, as a grandchild, you've got something of that. 
But you also have Merrill's virtuosic form and wit and wordplay. Um, the, 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 this poem actually strangely reminded me of One Art, uh, you know, Elizabeth Bishop's famous poem, One Art, in the sense, it, it seems to have an echo of a villanelle, and we'll talk more about the villanelle later, because it's an important form, I think, for you. But this, this kind of, this sense of a, a complex and, and very beautiful and ornate poem breaking down into something more personal. But before we go on to that, I thought, what do you think of my idea of you being the, uh, the grandchild of, uh, of Bishop and Merrill? It's too true. It's too true. I, I think my influences are on my sleeve. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I do think that I came to Merrill before I came to Bishop. I sort of got to Bishop through Merrill going backwards. Mm. Uh, because I think I share more of his, the sort of excesses of his sensibility. And you know, she's, and I hate to repeat the truism about her modesty, mm. uh, because I think that word is overused with relation to her. But, you know, she does, she is reticent and she uh, tries to be lighthearted even mm. about serious things. Mm. And uh, that appeals to me so much, especially as I've gotten older. Um, mm. The ability to look at life and its disappointments and, and worse with, uh, with that lightheartedness that I think that she, she got from Elizabethan poetry. And mm. All my favorite poets tend to love the Elizabethans. Mm. Mm. And Merrill, because you, 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 you've got his wit, and I'm, I use wit in the sense of intelligence and humor, kind of combined, almost hyphenated, that, that, that old fashioned sense of the word wit. And you know, that word play in this, you, you, I mean, so many of these, the poems are in wonderfully ornate form. Um, again, the, you know, that sort of reminds me of Merrill. We'll come back to him because I think one of the poems is actually sort of referencing directly a, a, a Merrill poem. You were breaking up a little there, so. Was I? Yeah, we, it's, it's a connection apparently. Um, so yes, I want to come on more in a moment to, to some of the other things I, I think. I, I thought before we moved on from this poem, I love the way that it moves from this beautiful description of the moth orchid, uh, orchid um, with these words, that, there's so many, you, your, your range of diction I'm afraid, is way beyond me. Um, but then breaks down to this sort of personal, and I thought you, you just might use it as a way just now of introducing your parents to us. Uh, it's, I always like to know about people's parents, it makes me sound like a, a psychoanalyst. <laughs> Tell me about your childhood, you know. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My real parents? Um, uh, well, I grew up in, outside of Philadelphia, we're in, in and around Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And my parents uh, had come to the US uh, barely a decade before I was born. Uh, they had lived in Brazil, mm. but uh, their parents had gone to Brazil as refugees after World War II. So um, there's no ethnic Brazilian in me, uh, but I grew up listening, hearing them speak Portuguese. My mother was Belarusian, my father was Hungarian, and they spoke those languages with their families. And then everybody spoke Portuguese when they got together. And this was mm. the milieu I grew up in for a long time. Mm. And I was the oldest child. So um, by the time, you know, my youngest sibling was born, they were becoming more Americanized. Mm. Mm. And do you think so that, I, go on, carry on. Well, I was, I'm, I might just then guess that, you know, in a milieu where there are multiple languages spoken, that was sort of the beginning of poetry for me. Mm, mm. That's what I was wondering, whether that uh, so there's a fascination in the whole of your poetry with language itself. Um, and I wonder whether that's partly at least rooted in that. I, it must be. Um, Robert Frost has that famous essay about the sound of sense where he talks about how the meaning of language comes through its tones 
so that hearing a conversation through a wall, mm. you can guess at what's being spoken. And that was basically what it was like growing up with my parents. I would have to guess mm. at what their languages were saying. Mm. Um, I would have to guess to what people were talking about through tone and mm. proper names and uh, theatrics. Um, mm. So the idea that meaning, meaning being upfront in language, um, that that it's not, it's never truly upfront for me, I suppose. I, I suppose I was acclimated early to the idea that meaning or semantic meaning isn't um, always clear. And I was probably fascinated early on with that. Mm. Mm. And we'll come back to saying a bit more about, uh, because the, the language in the poems, it's very, for me, is very, very striking. I wanted to come uh, to a poem uh, from Marvelous Things Overheard. Um, I thought we'd start with the first poem of that collection, The Grind. Um, again, a wonderful formal poem, um, which really struck me. So I, I thought let, let's, it'd be lovely to hear you read that, and, I, and let's talk a little bit about that from, from that collection. The grind. Three chabatini for breakfast, where demand for persnickety bread is small, hence its expense, hence my steadfast recalculation of my overhead, which soars. And as you might expect, the chabatini stand in for my fantasy of myself in a sea limbed prospect on a terrace with a lemon tree not assessed a fee for rent sent a day late, not fines accrued for a lost library book. Better never lose track of the date, oversleep and you're on the hook. It's the margin for error shrinking. It's life ground down to recurrence. It's fewer books read for the thinking, the hospital didn't rebuild the insurance, the school misplaced the kids' paperwork. Here's our sweet pup, a rescue, which we nonetheless paid for. And look, he gets more grooming than I do. When I turn my hand mill, I think of the dowager who ground gems on ham for her guests. The queen who ground out two cups of flour on the pregnant abdomen of her husband's mistress. I think of a great rock eating bird grinding out a sandy beach, the foam said to be particulate matter of minute crustaceans, each brilliantly spooning up Aphrodite to Greek porticos and our potatoes and plain living, which might be shaken by infinitesimal tattoos. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. I really love this poem. Um, the, the, the first thing that strikes me about it is there's so much to enjoy. And, and that's one of the things I've noticed throughout your collections that you, so sometimes contemporary poets don't seem to want to let you enjoy yourself. Um, and there's, there seems so much Sorry, in your- Sorry, you're breaking up on that. So, sometimes contemporary you. poets don't seem to want you to enjoy yourself. Whereas in yours, you, you seem to really want to enjoy, let, let have the reader enjoy like this lovely ABA, rhyming scheme you've got in this, um, um, the language, the panitiki bread. Um, I love that joke about the, the, the rescue pup who gets more grooming than I do. Um, um, is that something in, for you that you're trying to give people an, you know, something to enjoy? Do you, you do believe that that's what poetry needs to be? Yeah, it is, is a controversial opinion, I suppose, but I think that poetry, uh, even at its most erudite, uh, is entertainment. Mm. And it's a species of entertainment. And I agree wholeheartedly with Ezra Pound, who said something like, you know, poetry should not, I mean, he said, music should not stray too far from the dance and poetry should not stray too far from music. Mm. And um, I do think that, you know, the notion of dancing and of music is important to, to, to the enjoyment of poetry. 
it, mm. it's there you know it's, it's the dance of the intellect mm. 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 and then talk, talking about this dance of the intellect the other, the other thing that striking struck me when i wrote because i originally actually thought that it finished on the first page um with that he gets more grooming than i do uh, and it's quite interesting because you turn the page to the last three verses of the poem and you do this huge leap um in those last three verses and at times completely lose me um i mean that in all friendship <laughs> um what can you say something about that leap from you know up, up to then i was following you fairly closely um uh, can you say something about that about that leap that you make there in after in the, after, on, after verse five? Yeah, I think it's the camera pulls back. You know, I think that you get a close up of the life. Um, you know, a humorous or comical close up of life lived. You know, in the hectic way that we do, the prosaic life, and then. Um, you sort of pan back with a more philosophical perspective. Um, so I'm thinking of the metaphor of grinding. So we use the term, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a cliche, you know, just the grind, the, the commute, the, the work, the hmm. taking care of kids. Um, so if, thinking back to, um, different definitions of grinding, thinking back to this idea of grinding salt and the idea uh, and um, the idea that, for instance, the da with the dowager or the, the queen, that there's, there's some uh, level of life that you get to where you get to, do, you do the grinding, that you're not the one ground. Hmm. It's, um, just a figure, I suppose, for the, 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 this grand um, idea that you know every that entropy entropy is really grinding us down. That there's some great force out there, very slowly grinding us, um, which is why it ends with the um, with salt and the ocean mm. and these tiny particular um, animals in the foam. Hmm. And the foam, and foam being actually a, a, a generative image, right? Hmm. Um, and, the, and even the minute crust crustaceans, it's it's life, life itself, hmm. and it. So it, I suppose, makes a kind of cycle. One gets ground down into this sort of salt or sand or rock, and then one is born up again by the tiniest life forms, and begins the cycle all over again. Hmm. Is that? <laughs> that makes sense. I, I didn't think I got it when I read it, but that, that does make complete sense. Um, yes, indeed. Um, the other, yeah, the, the other thing to, to, to start to talk about is this the range of language. Um, sometimes it's almost alarmingly erudite. Um, uh, I don't think I'm very erudite myself, I'm afraid. And uh, at times it's yeah, almost alarmingly, it's got this un unusual... You know, there's a range of language there's sort of what I've called alarming erudition, but there's also this playfulness all the time. Um, your reading seems to be very important in your in your poems. Yeah, I think that literature is um, superior to life. So, <laughs> you know, I think it's the better part of life or the, you know, more pleasurable part mm. of life in the long run. And I think life exists to be turned into literature, really. Mm. Um, and that's certainly part of what this whole, this poem is about, I think, is that, you know, no matter how um, hectic my life had been at certain points, um, the, the phrase grist for the mill comes to mind now, that must mm. be part of it, um, mm. Mm. so that, even poetry becomes, in a way, a mill. You know, mm. uh, one one takes one's life, the raw material of one's life, and then turns it into something that's more interesting, um, mm. and more stylish, um, more mm. entertaining, uh, mm. more hum more. I was going to say humane, but uh, 
simply more attractive, I suppose. Mm -hmm. That's great. I'd like to ask you more about that, but we might come back to that later. So let's, but I'd like you to read this other poem, Bliss Street. I don't know whether it is, but is, is this, um, was this written in Beirut? I looked, I eventually looked up Bliss Street. Yeah, yes. Yes, it is the main street that runs in front of the American University. I lived mm. for a year. Mm -hmm. And it was originally pub published in the New Yorker, I think, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So let, let's hear this poem. I, I, a, this is a different, it, yeah. it feels a different sort of speech, this poem again. Yes, this is, uh, this is in free verse, so. Mm. Shall I begin? Yes, let's, let's, let's hear it, yeah. Okay. List Street. From this balcony, the sight lines are clear to the rooftop volleyball court of my son's elementary school. From its mesh cage, the kids at PE class raise a right ruckus. I look over, is he up there now? No, this is a different period. I'm squeezing some orange halves on a cheap plastic boat with a dome like a parliament and teeth at the spout to catch seeds and pulp. Dragging a haul of juicing oranges all the way down campus in my bag stitched with the word Cyprus. I recall the oranges were mostly on the trees in Cyprus. It was the potato we were about then, the famous Cypriot grown in red dirt and baked, quote, in its jacket, fluffy as a buttered cloud. We would pass the fields of red dirt and in a schoolyard and wonder what it would be like to be a child raised on an island like this, squat between sun and sea, never an ice age, abounding with indigenous flowers, evolving freely without extinctions. But, oh yeah, massacres, barbed wire slicing Nicosia in a crescent ghetto. My grandmother picked potatoes on a collective farm at the age of nine after her father died. But the funny story she told was of having shut herself inadvertently in the potato cellar while her mother was ill with pneumonia. The eldest child she knew that if her mother died as well, it would be all on her shoulders, the infant, the other children, and already terrified to begin with, she began bawling. But you know, someone let her out after a few hours. Her mother survived the pneumonia. She survived the potato farm. <laughs> then when she was 18 and working in a hospital kitchen, her supervisor, opened the pantry and gestured toward the potatoes, pocketing some in her overcoat. She was terrified all over again. If she did help herself, their boss, a kind man, would find out. If she didn't help herself, her supervisor would know she knew. She didn't take the potatoes and she didn't get fired. And decades later, she would return to the scene of demoralization, her version of the Stalin years. The volleyball court has gone silent. The PE teacher, whose name I don't remember, rests his arms against the ledge and overlooks the street, the campus, my building, in which I sit, stuck in a thought about potatoes. He stands there a minute or two in repose then turns and walks away, leaving the scene unpopulated as in some sketch or exercise by a painter removed from the north to a Mediterranean Arcadia full of ruins and cypresses. Oh, it would be an exaggeration to say it's full of ruins here. More like one of those mythological scenes with youths and gods in a crowded sky, Bliss Street overflowing with students slowing traffic as they drift across the road, scooters clustered outside the gate inscribed with the motto, quote, that life may be lived more abundantly. Perfect motto for a university. Perfect as the fig trees were perfect that grew all into one boxy wreath round the dry fountain the kids on rented bicycles circled madly. That survived the civil war by the looks of their thick trunks ringed by apartment blocks and antennae raised into a looming cloud the color of putty. Putty, not putty. <laughs> <laughs> that's lovely that's such a lovely poem um 
I mean, the, one thing I, it's, it's a, for, for you, it's a little bit unusual because it's more of a narrative poem. And again, it does remind me, you know, those, those Bishop poems where she sort of describes something for a long time, you don't really know quite why, and yet it's really, really beautiful. Um, there's something of that. Um, I couldn't help thinking of the drunkenness of things various um, with your orange pips. Um, I don't know whether you had McNeese in mind somewhere. Ah, uh, yes, I always do. Mm. In the back of my, I, I do have McNeese, a good amount of McNeese in my mind. Mm. Mm. I thought he would. Uh, there's might another. There's another Bishop fan, uh, James Schuyler, the New York School poet. Uh, mm. It occurred to me when I was rereading this poem that his poem February stands also a little behind my. Mm my poem i don't know if you know it but it's yeah. he's looking at a he's looking out a window and there's a woman in the opposite building in a window holding her baby up mm. uh, to see the um to look at the sunset and so he sees this woman framed with her baby in a window like a madonna and child um and then he surveys the rooftop when the colors of the sunset and there are two lions like mediterranean of uh, lions facing each other on the roof. So mm. it, it, there's so many poems that stand behind my poems. Oh. Mm. And, it, and it only occurs to me years later that that's mm. what's going on. Mm, I'm sure, I'm sure. And it, it, is it an immigration poem? Because it, re reading it, I thought, oh, this is an, it's an immigration, it's a very understated immigration poem. I love the fact that you set up a drama that never happens, which is so often like life, isn't it? One, this could happen, that can happen, and very often actually it doesn't. Um, and I, I, really, I, I like the truthfulness of that. Are those real stories about your grandmother? Um, and I said it's, it feels like an immigration poem, and you know, um, is that a real story? It's nice of you to say that. I, it, those are real stories that she told me. Um, you know, they feel very fragmented, and there was a language barrier, and I wish I knew more. Mm. Um, but obviously she was much on my mind as I was adjusting to a new country and new languages. Of course. And the other, the other thing I thought about is that one of the things I've been feeling reading the poems is that um, it is as if your, your, your experience of writing poetry, and correct me if I'm wrong, is, is, is as if life is already a poem and you're trying to write it. And I thought this was a very good example about it. It feels like you're in the poem, trying to discover the poem that is in life already, like the putty at the end and the, um, but I think that seems a theme throughout your writing, that at one point you say something uh, about that even, you say nothing is an accident in love or literature, um, which we'll come back, come back to, and that's in your poem Epic. But uh, is, that, is that the case? Are you trying to sort of find the, the poem of life in your life? It would be nice to think so. Um, often I think that the life is just an excuse. Uh, it's just, it's, it's secondary, um, you know, interest. Uh, the interest really is in creating the object, the poem, and mm -hmm. in the language of the poem finding the language of the poem. And, um, and life is, is a kind of prompt. But really what I'm interested in is are the rhymes. Um, and that's one reason I just don't write free verse anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just too interesting to see how the rhymes come in and how life um, provides for rhymes. And I, mean, and I mean a rhyme very broadly. Um, you know, not only oral rhyme, but sight rhyme and me metaphors are a kind of rhyme and, mm. um, you know, echoes. Where should we go now? Uh, yeah, let's go to Distant Mandate, um, your, the collection after Marvelous Things Ever Heard, this collection. Um, I don't know whether you feel this, Angie, but I thought that this, I, I thought this was quite a step forward for me, the Distant Mandate. Um, so that's like a rude thing to say, but I, I was really struck by it as a, as a step, especially into formal verse. And um, yeah, what, what do, 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 would you agree with that? With that, is that your sense of the collection? 
Yes, I mean, I, I'm not unhappy with marvelous things overheard, but I think, you know, it was a bridge to, uh, to something more profound, a discovery I made about the formal capacity of language to create poems. I almost feel like I'm a facilitator for language, the poems that language wants to be made into. Mm -hmm. And that can only happen, you know, when you sort of give up the ego, or you relinquish the ego and let the language uh, make a poem using constraints. So the constraints sort of filter out your personality or your, you know, your, your need for expression and you're left with this, uh, you know, wonderful raw material that wants to be shaped and rhymed mm -hmm. into a musical composition. Mm -hmm. So I felt that with that discovery, uh, I just ran with it. Um, you know, formal verse has a sort of dicey reputation in the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. There's some, there's conventional wisdom says that, you know, since Whitman, you know, the only democratic verse is free verse. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think people are scared away from what they call formalism as though formalism were separable from poetry, which for me it isn't. Mm. Uh, so I, I think it takes a certain amount of courage to buck against this convention of, you know, the only good verse is free verse or that poetry is self-expression at heart or liber you know, liberating the self. You know, I don't, I don't buy into any of that. Mm. Mm. I mean, so for me, it's those formal things that I find so exciting. Um, you know, that they, they create such a sense of musicality and pleasure um, that they draw me into the poem. Um, but it is strange, isn't it, that formal verse has become, you know, it, people tend to think it's sort of even right wing or, you know, fuddy duddy or, you know, e even that modern life can't possibly rhyme or something sort of weird, you know. Um, is that there's an odd, in the UK as well, an odd kind of hangover about rhyme and metre. A sort of... What can you say? I, you know, I think... What, what can I say that won't get me into trouble? Um, yes. <laughs> I, I think that... You know, I think that it took me years to be able to do the, the things that I do. And people don't have patience for that. Um, people mm. want to be able to take a, a writing course or a, take a two or three year degree and be a poet. And mm. it, it, took, it took me decades. Mm. So I think there's this, uh, there's a sort of consumer mandate, commercial capitalist, you know, no, I blame capitalism I, for, for free verse. Um, the idea that you can have art very quickly, hmm. uh, you can be an artist very quickly and all you need is feelings and self-expression. Um, you know, that goes hand in hand with marketing and the professionalization of poetry and making a career. And really it's, as an art, it's just a very slow art and you need you need to strike a balance between sort of the formal dexterity that um, only a very pliable young brain can have and then the wisdom of age. And if you can sort of hit the sweet spot, mm. then I think, it, you you know, verse, verse is a very powerful art form. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. And it needs to be taught. It needs to be taught uh, when children are younger i mean it's hard to get to college and develop an ear mm. you know we should be developing children's ears when they're in grade school and middle school mm. and and give them you know proper literature in high school not not bestsellers or ya literature mm. see i'm now i'm going to get into trouble <laughs> I, don't want to, I don't want to get you into trouble, but um, I completely agree, uh, obviously. Um, let, let's hear one of the poems, um, this the wonderful poem, Milkweed. Um, let's, let's just get you to, to, to read that, and then I, um, I've got a few things I wanted to ask you about that. 
Okay, let me let me just rehearse the, the word for milkweed, the scientific word, asclepiidae. Asclepiidae. Yeah. Right. Milkweed. It's August. Loosely we follow the arc of the monarch. A pilgrimage north, a pivot, a ritorno. Montreal, where the earring on a bow is genuine chrysalis. Bon courage. The milkweed it's fed on renders it poison in lieu of camouflage. Resources by nature and tested abound underground the Keystone State. Above the sanctuary of Asclepidae, sea milkweed, is twined with monarch larvae, a stand in for the healer snakes and its floss. The forests are a trickery of acoustic baffles, hemlock not wedlock, fern and moss. The wedlock was not the toxic chalice given philosopher's wives or Alice when she shrank to a footstool size. Reality must be with three, not two, a prize. While a monarch heads toward Virginia, as do we, I indulge in that which is by definition interesting to one, nostalgia. Magnets in the antennae help orient the monarch, seemingly vagrant, but espoused to minuscule lodestones. Mine gravitate to bittersweet zones driven by memories, not instinct. Driving through the heartland of sad songs builds a contract stronger than the one we ate. We're driving backward through the season. No more hint of gold on trees on wine red stems along the roadway. In the South, it's still hot and florid as a tiger's mouth. My dear, not one of these black and oranges shows their offspring the whole route over gaps in generations and mountain ranges. Louisiana, the wind's cessation, let that stand for the cessation of the stained glass tattered demalion in the grass who alit on one of us like a sign of grace. Loosely, we follow the arc of the monarch back to Texas, to our own backyard where I planted milkweed towards cessation of ache. Mm. Right. Thank you, thank you. I mean, the uh, three things I wanted to mention here is, again, the sort of difficulty of the language, some of the language, you know, um, I think I read a New York Review of books, uh, New York Review where he was saying that, you know, you need Google um, very close at hand. Um, but, but, yeah, but then also this again this breakthrough into the personal into that ache at the end and something that seems again a a, a, a presence in your poems that they, they sometimes seem like very disguised love poems uh, and i wondered whether this this feels like to me a love poem um but very you know that the you know I, i've i've got I've, I've written one of one of your poems a list of the things i can see in your work like uh, plants, gardening, travel, literature, two sons, and then I put a husband, question mark. <laughs> <laughs> question mark, questionable. <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, this would be a divorce poem or a, mm. or a leading up to a divorce poem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that's what I thought it was possibly. A... It's always surprising to me when people guess these things. I, I always think that I'm misdirecting people, but... Mm. Mm. So the, the tension that creates uh, you, between, you, you I stopped again the, the tension that creates between um, you know this very ornate and latinate style and the gorgeous rhymes I, I mean for me rhyme is just a pleasure and uh, your rhymes are outrageous at times yes. and really pleasurable They're, you know you just want to read them again and again just for the rhyme um, I was just reading a part of um, just this morning, reading James Merrill, um, the book of Ephraim. And, you know, it goes into Terzarima and you, you just want to read it again and again for how clever he pulls off that form and how chatty it seems to be. Um, Absolutely. Uh, that light, that lightly, that, that lightly warm, you know, um, virtuosity. And then this kind of, but something serious and even painful being alluded to. In, in this case, just in the word ache almost, in that, my dear, that sudden change of tone of, of the intimate personal, 
um, and a shift of language, a subtle shift of language from that my dear. Yeah, that comes at the point where, you know, you know, this was prompted by, a, you know, some article on monarch butterflies and um, the idea that the, the whole route, the migration route isn't, you know, the, the parents can't show the children the whole route. Mm. And this is a, and since this is a, um, it's a road trip poem, mm -hmm. um, there's a sense that even though, you know, there's this family on this road trip making the circle, there, there is a, the whole journey is going to, to be undertaken with the children, mm. if you see what I mean. So there's a sense that there will be some loss, there's some loss forthcoming. And then I just had fun rhyming arc with monarch and then the slant rhyme with ache. Mm, mm. So monarch, arc, and ache. Mm. That's really the engine of the poem, like moth and kid, moth orchid was the engine of that poem. Mm, mm. Yes, yes, indeed. Let, let's move on to another poem, Listening Posts, um, again from uh, Distant Mandate. There just seems one after another of these very achieved poems, but, you know, the... You know, when I try to write like this, it takes you forever, doesn't it? it nearly, people don't realise how difficult, how difficult it is to write in formal ways like this that, that work. Um, they take forever. So let's let's hear listening posts and let's talk a little bit about that as well. All right, listening posts. As these things go, it's fun to watch my riveted son fly an F-16 on a tiny screen, topographically green. His speed on airstrips achieves its own eclipse as he sublimes into the blue. Contrails spastically accrue and the distance is so great it traverses seemingly the state of ecstasy and nothing more to do with, say, the coming war. Antennae of the listening post, a light seemed to scan for ghosts amid the voices of the med, dust, the mint, and fennel fed. Standing on the limestone rock with family, run out of talk as an hourglass, its sand. I waited to be gainsaid again by any such ghost as would appear to overturn my muted fear and top off my head with hope of tiny jewels speckling taupe. Jets reduced to colored specks, and again from Rex to Rex, project voices into space of men in not a suit, a case. Meanwhile, I, with sapphire posts in both ears, beg to differ if this sand flourishing thistle is not equally epistle from the backyards of hackneyed plant life we call weed. It whispers of the coming battle, feeding time dust to time and basil. Mm. Yeah, thank you. You know, in, in rhyming couplets, um, the, the point I want, what, what struck me here again is, is, is the coming war. Um, one of the things that strikes me about contemporary poetry is it, is, it seems to be a, a massive question now about what to write about. If, if one writes, what, the instinct is to write from your direct experience. But given that we know so much of horrors, that so easily can sound, can seem kind of self-indulgent, you know, talking about your one's broken heart or something, or the weather seems self-indulgent. But then very often to write about the horrors that we merely read about or watch on the news seems a kind of um, trauma voyeurism, you know, uh, and, and too easily used in a poem to give it weight that it doesn't really deserve because you know, you've just watched it on the news or something. And one of the things I see in your poems is this, uh, this, this desire, this even struggle to sort of open to both the directly personal, you know, this is, uh, you know, a lovely poem about your son, one of your sons playing a game, I presume, and, and this echo into the terrible things that we hear and trying to make a space for both and using rhyme as a way of holding them together is, is how I saw it. Anyway, I don't know whether that, captures it for you. Absolutely. Um, 
you know, I think the metaphor of the, you know, fighter jet and the video game, um, the actual listening posts, which were in Cyprus, uh, and the idea of military outposts, um, you know, we don't have, we, if you grow up in the US, you don't necessarily think of, you know, um, military, mil military outposts and, um, you know, we don't have foreign powers, military outposts in our backyards. And mm -hmm. so to go to a place like Cyprus and, and, you know, have that presence, which is, you know, on that, it's basically a pleasure island, you know, it's a tourist island. It's, it's a, it's a place that kids go to party and, and people go to retire and live the good life. And yet there are these military outposts there and, and the listening posts and, uh, you know, th those were incongruous things to me, uh, even being myself just a tourist there. So I do think that being a poet, you know, is about keeping your ears open and and being attuned to various dissonances as well as harmonies in life and, and the incongruities. And also to, you know, you're a bit of a Cassandra, you're always thinking, you know, you're always trying to predict the future or, or read the tea leaves, read the, read the augers, the birds in the sky. And so I think that that's probably been a more fruitful route for me to, you know, let the world in, the difficulties of the world in to the poems, rather than just go by headlines hmm. to, you know, sort of, um, I just don't believe that poetry, a vicarious experience, ever ends up doing doing its doing the work. Um, mm. It's easy to be outraged by a headline, but until something is actually in your life, there there isn't that deep feeling that poetry comes out of. Mm. And I, and you know, and if it's simply a, a poem that arises from feelings. That emerge from a headline or something on TV, it's it feels like you're profiting from it, that you're turning, mm. that, you, that the poem is a kind of um, profit you made from someone else's misery. So I'm keenly, keenly aware of that. Mm. Yes, yeah, so that, that 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 that's my sense. Is it is is another un, unearned weight, isn't it? And as you say, it, it feels like you end up profiting from other people's suffering and. Really, I, I sort of feel sometimes it's none of our business, uh, especially to make a rhyme out of, or a, you know, or, or something that's to be to be about ourselves. Um, and yet, you, you, you're, I really like the way you manage somehow to balance that the personal and the the, the awareness of the public. Um, I, I think it all comes out in the metaphors. Um, mm. You know, it's it's simply an apprehension of the metaphors involved and being awake to those. Mm, yeah, yeah, indeed. So let's go to, I'd, I'd like you to read the first part of um, Frontier. Um, um, I'd, I'd like to hear more of it, but just to keep us moving, but let, let's go to that first part of Frontier. We, we're still on distant, um, all of these are from distant mandates, one after another that I wanted to talk to you about, but yes, let's, let's, let's hear that. Frontier. A riderless ass gallops up to your wagon. Your child is sleeping through the jolts. It's a bad omen. It portends some kind of agon. Camels drafted into the Confederacy are gone. Their Arab handlers intermarry with the slaves. They could scare a colt into your wagon, trample fences, and into the bargain cause mules to self-impale on barbed wire. Tides rifle Nautilus. The frontier agon involves cholera and Karankawa jargon in your kitchen, remanding sweet potatoes. A Frenchman tries to hitch a camel to his wagon, but the beast of the casita goes native again and breeds until hunting parties guarantee reduction. Ergo, no more agon. Even the horses hated its scent. The Karankawa vanish into the Kualpatikan, but now a riderless ass gallops up to your wagon. It's a bad omen. It portends a new agon. 
That's wonderful. Uh, wonderful and difficult. <laughs> um, it's difficult to read, yes. It is difficult to read, isn't it? I mean, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is the Villanelle as a structure. Quite a few of your poems, at least more than the, the average, are sort of rebooted Villanelles or somehow have Villanelle, the Villanelle form sort of hovering in them. Or, you know, and this one is, feels to me like a Villanelle. Um, can you say something about that form and what attracts you to it? Because again, people are quite snooty about the Villanelle, you know, uh, the, that it can't do anything nowadays and so on and so on. Well, these are slightly warped Villanelles. Um, these, well, no, these, I, I think I started it with the, um, this long poem from Marvelous Things Ever Heard, uh, Wingen de Koya, yes. which, which was, which took the history of, North Carolina or the Outer Banks. And this takes uh, off from the history of Texas and the coast of East Texas. So I think the Villanelle for me is uh, correlated to history mm. and probably because of this, a sense of the cyclical nature of history or uh, history chasing its own tail. Um, and the Villanelle with its, its it, you know, it, it was a rural medieval form that arose from, you know, agricultural mm. uh, cycles, seasons. Uh, so I think the, that's the idea that, um, that history repeats itself. Uh, and um, it, that I, I, I suppose that's sort of form commenting on history or, or a commentary by a form on history. Yes, 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 indeed. The, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about, use this poem to talk to you about, is the difficulty of your poems. Um, you know, what, what strikes you immediately is the beauty of them, but also the difficulty, the wit, as I said, um, these breakthroughs into the, the personal, which I see again, they're, they're always rooted enough in the personal um, and they never seem to me to go to be just a sort of something that someone has read. But yeah, I wanted to ask you about difficulty and what you feel about the difficulty in your, your poems. Um, my fear of difficulty, I suppose, is that, um, well, I don't know, I suppose it's, can it, can it be off-putting? Um, uh, why, why does it need to be difficult? Um, I've got mixed feelings about difficulty, I suppose, is what I'm saying. <laughs> I, I, I don't think that I, I, I don't strive for difficulty per se. Mm. And I, you know, I hear tell that they're difficult. Uh, but I, for me, I'm, I want to build something that lasts. Mm. And I think that a poem that sort of spills all its secrets to soon isn't giving itself a chance to last that long or mm. to achieve any of the sense of intrigue that I look for in art. Um, mm. It's all very emotional. It's all very personal. What I look for in art, I try to imitate myself. Mm. So, uh, you know, if I'm drawn, if, I, if my poems are a bit different, Called, you know, is probably because the poems I like are also a bit difficult. You know, Bishop took, it took decades for people to truly begin to appreciate Elizabeth Bishop. Um, mm. Merrill, it's still, it seems to me, he's still, uh, you know, on his way to a full appreciation of him in yeah. American poetry. So, you know, and music too. Um, you know, my favorite composers, people thought Mozart was difficult when mm. Mozart was writing. And, mm. you know, in a way, he seems the most fluent and approachable of all mm. composers. And yet, mm. and yet, mm. uh, so things that seem difficult in their own day, miraculously seem less difficult as time goes by and more things get unpacked. Mm. So I guess it's just playing the long game. Yeah, that's very striking because one of the things I've noticed is that, you know, poetry is a form to be reread, isn't it? it? It's the only form to be reread. And um, I've been rereading your poems a lot and they keep on, they keep on giving me pleasure. 
so often you you, know, you read read a poem and you, you sort of basically feel well I've kind of got it really. Um, whereas this I, I keep on, and again it feels like that, that, that I, I I I I suppose I'm, I'm I'm a bit of a Merrill devotee. He, I mean he's not if he's not very well read in the US he's hardly read in the UK at all I think. Um, that mixture of virtuosity and lightness and seriousness the English don't seem to like for some reason. Um, it, it seems like having him in the room with you when you read his poems. Yes. You know, he's he's very personable. He's he's good company. Mm -hmm. And I guess I suppose I hope I'm not so difficult that I'm not good company at least sometimes <laughs> in in the poems. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because you can you take me to an edge of difficulty where I could lose lose a sense of company. Then you you, you come back to something that you know, like those posts in the earring. I really like the. Uh, you know, um, those, you, you kind of bring us back to something that is very now here, you know. Um, let, let's go on to okay. Brood Blocks in the Wild, Hollycox, uh, um, which sounds like a, 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 a sort of title from Stevens, I thought. Um, some of your titles want to be uh, like little poems in their own right, aren't they? Um, you know, um, just go, you know, one of, you know, we're going to finish it later in the interview with a horse does not want to be Fred X, um, which for me reminded me of Marianne Moore's, you know, I like a, a mule, but I have a fellow feeling. No, I like a horse, but I have a fellow feeling for a mule, which is a wonderful poem in one in the title. So I think it's something in your, at times in your titles where we're getting a little poem just in the title. And I, I think this is one of them. So let's hear um, Breeze Blocks in the Hollyhocks. Breeze blocks in the wild hollyhocks. There should be a healthy trade in sandbags. Cement should be our chief export. Some of it's made a stadium, some a prison. Slurry is churned from the rainy season. At any time, any number of yellow hatted helots surrounds one volatile jackhammer or backhoe askew on a quickening dune. Shouldn't sand mute the machinery steps away as it had done the massacre behind the scenery. Blue sky like empty seats offsets the soldier at the curve of the headland posed between what else? Sandbags with his ammunition band, AK-47, coated beret and bored demeanor switching tack to an Ides of March smile. Right side of concertina wire, I smile back. Mm. That's just great. That's just really great. I'm, I must admit, I get, I actually get jealous of your capacity with rhyme and meter. I just think, if only I could have written that. Um, <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so again, it's, it, um, it's a war poem, um, a very, very delicately balanced war poem. Is, is it something you want to say about the war poem there? Um, I, you know, I was, I, this was a scene in, from Beirut, um, which was highly militarized. I, I was there in a blessedly peaceful interlude in 2009, 2010 before the Syrian war, but it was a highly militarized place uh, with you know, weapons and barbed wire and armed guards you know, on, at parking lots and buildings, building doorways and gates. Um, so, you no, know, and I was walking around with two little kids all the time. Uh, and at one point, you know, it, well, it, you know, often they would smile and wave. Uh, there was at least one incident in which I was harassed by, by an armed guard while I was walking my child home from nursery school. And uh, so the, the sense of danger was, you know, profound. Uh, so this isn't just, a, again, you know, a headline poem or, a, or something I made up. It's, uh, mm. you know, it, it comes out of that experience. Mm. 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 Let, let's, let's move on. Let's go on to Borrowed Bio, because that's another one I, that, that, that's a, like, because I want to make sure we've got a little bit of time to talk about Epic before we wind up. But let's go to Borrowed Bio, which, um, again, I want this, I think this was pub published in poetry, wasn't it, originally? I think so. Yeah, I think so. OK. 
nutrient borrowed by it. Where we'd recently lain, exchanging a kiss, stork consorted with crane, limpkin with ibis. Was this as much wedding as there would ever be? The fowl's foot webbing, the identificatory ring around a throat? Exchange of earth and air, not a vow, but a vote of confidence a feather might tip by a single scale. That one's a raconteur, so much salt in his tail. This one's a countertenor, lilting above the feast. The archon of his hectare, spotted, spotted least. Here's a little heckler. Penciled seagull in the margin. Following line by line, the path you took, I imagine no print so fine. Mm. Look, I, I, I hear Marianne Moore at the back of this poem very much. Um, no, no swan prince, so fine. No swan so fine, exactly. Um, uh, lovely. I, I really like that kind of no print so fine, no swan so fine. And it's got something, of, you know, all of those wonderful animal poems that uh, Moore writes with that wonderful sort of syntax that she uses. Was, was she, was she, is she important to you, Marianne Moore? Oh, very, mm. very. Uh, she and Wallace Stevens um, mm. going as far back as when I was a teenager. Mm. especially her first book, Observations. Mm. Mm. Well, when did you start writing poetry? Uh, or when did poetry come into your life? If, sorry? Uh, 15 or 16 years old. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's why, you know, it has such a powerful hold in a person. It's usually something you stumble into in adolescence and, and it gets seared into your brain because of all the... Mm. Yeah, all the adolescent fireworks in the in the synapses. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what what was it? Was there a particular moment that sort of that it seared into your brain? Was it a particular poem, a particular poet? You know, it's it's such a cliche, but when I read uh, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, that's when all the like, you know, all the fireworks went off. The rhyme, the meter, the echo, the the imagery. It all just came together. Uh, but there had been other poems that had intrigued me and I, I warmed to the puzzle making aspect of poems when I, I read the Rubiat of Omar oh. Khayyam, um, the Fitzgerald translation of that. Mm. I, I read that in some anthology somewhere and I was intrigued with quatrains and putting together, putting meaning together through these, you know, quatrains and syntax and um and yeah i think those two experiences were, were hugely influential mm. and say something about the title of this borrowed bio why why a borrowed bio um well it by the end i'm reading a, a book i've borrowed from someone and mm. and looking at all the places that he's ticked off or underlined and mm. which look like little birds but um mm. It's also a, a, about ventriloquism or um, it's about life becoming um, art. I mean, the bio, bio, you know, meaning life, but, all oh. our, but it's a shorthand for biography. And it's really about the, the passage from, from life into print and into the word. Hmm. Um, and a kind of obsession with that, and how mm. life is how life is improved or made more beautiful by becoming word. Mm. Mm. I want to move on to um, epic, which is it seems to me the sort of central poem of distant mandate. Um, you know, in, in quite a few sections, um, mo, mo, you know, beautifully rhymed. Uh, it. it so uh, perhaps you might start by saying a little bit about you know come it's sort of very much an echo of Merrill's from the uh, from the cupola, which is already a difficult poem in its own right. I've read it a good few times, and, and it's one of those poems you keep coming back to to try to try to get closer to. Um, um, say something about how how you sort of where where where, where you came from 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 Merrill's poem there. Um, I was, I, I was riveted by 
from the cupola, uh, I was galvanized by it. Hmm. Um, especially I came to it through that sonnet with the five senses, um, where the five senses are children. Hmm. Uh, it's a little sonnet embedded in from the cupola. Hmm. And uh, I thought his mastery is was phenomenal. And, uh, and I wanted to do some I wanted to pay, you know, an homage to it. Uh, you know, and I don't by any means think that my poem is as, as, as successful. And in fact, um, it was suggested to me that I might even try to rewrite it. Uh, but I just, I wanted to, to rewrite the psyche, the Cupid and Psyche myth uh, in New York, set in New York or Brooklyn, New York. Um, and I wanted to pay homage to his poem. And, uh, yeah, I wanted to create a kind of um, supernatural channel between us mm. by channeling his his, his poem. Mm. Mm. Let, let's hear the first section and then, then we'll say, if I had my, my way, we'd go through the whole thing, but um, let's hear the first section. Epic. It's you I'd like to see Greece again with, you I'd like to take to a bed of cyclamen. You know I nurse a certain myth about myself, that I descend de tribu d'origine asiatique, an empire Thracian or Macedonian, cleaving to a Hellenic mystique after centuries of migration inland. Full moon over the Acropolis. I can repeat the scene, this time adieu, as then I had no one to kiss, slicing halloumi amid the hullabaloo of a rooftop taverna in July. The doors that opened to lovers pulled like tree roots from darkness. I close upon us now like book covers. The alcove in which we embrace is cool with brilliant tile and weirded by a dove's note, chase of ouzo with ouzni, junta style. History makes its noise. We duck till it passes. Love, we think, is our due. Not, we think, like the epic, the unchosen thing we're wedded to. That's a, it's a wonderful um, poem, I think. Um, I really love how history makes its noise. We dark till, it's part, till it passes. Um, and, and one of the things I, that strikes me about this is, is, that this is just, that's just the first section. But we move from, we move, we, we, there's this interesting drift in the poem from the everyday, you know, you get a parcel yeah. that arrives that you wrote, sent to yourself um, at one, in one section. There's a letter from, to a tenant about a, a mirror. That, uh, that it's, got a lo it's got Merrill's like love poem in the background. It's a, a love poem as well. Um, but we never quite know who to. That's why I've got a husband, question mark. <laughs> um, but you, there's this, this, this lovely sort of sliding between the ordinary and the everyday and the myth, um, myth of psyche in this case. Can you say something about myth in your work? Because it sort of haunts this poem in particular. It really wasn't until I lived in Beirut and traveled around the Mediterranean that I conceived this very powerful feeling that the farther poetry strays from its Mediterranean roots, the poorer it is, the more impoverished it is. Hmm. And I think these myths are, uh, while they can seem hackneyed, especially to an American with no real experience of the depth of literature, the history of literature, they're really uh, just endless, they're endlessly generative, especially if you even dabble in the languages that they come from. So, you know, I dabbled a little bit in Arab and Arabic uh, in Beirut, but I had a little bit of Greek. Um, I dabbled a little bit in Latin, tried to read some Ovid in Latin. Mm. And I think when you go to the original languages and you read the original text, if you even read the Homeric hymns and, you know, even in translation, they're, they're powerful mm. uh, archaic documents emotion archaic emotional and spiritual documents and it's impossible not to come away from those things without this 
profound sense of the um, psychic power there. And so, so in a, you know, and I certainly believe in gods. Um, I believe that, you know, Eros is a god. I, I believe that, um, you know, Aries is a god. <laughs> so what, love, war, the sun, the winds, the wind, you know, the, the named winds, the I, god at the sea, like, yeah, they're gods. And I think that once you, once you submit yourself to these um, powers that are, you know, greater than yourself, it, it's very much like submitting to the language in writing a poem. Uh, you realize, you know, the fragility of the self and the ego and how we, we are really the creatures of these, of these powerful forces. And that's an enormous source of poetry. Um, and so now I can't really conceive of poetry without them. Mm. And so Cupid and Psyche was one myth I was working with for a long time. This isn't the only poem. There's at least one in uh, my forthcoming book that's also a Cupid and Psyche poem. And it's about the not being able to look love in the face or look the god of love in the face. Or, yeah. And I love the simile myth too for that reason, that the idea that you can't quite look the god in the face or you can't know everything, you can't see everything, you have to live in some negative capability in regard to Eros is a very powerful idea. And, um, and worth exploring in poem, I thought. Mm. And you know, with, with the former, because it, it, it's, it's in, I can't remember how many sections, but it's, it's quite a few sections and very in different forms. Did, did you know it was going to be that kind of length? We'll hear another little section in a minute. But... No, this, uh, I, there was a bit of a, a time limit. There was a constraint on it because I wanted to write it at a point where I was by myself in a little Airbnb in New York City in Brooklyn, Crown Heights as a, as a matter of fact, with, with significance in the words Crown Heights. Hmm. And so I was, I was milking my life for as many metaphors as I could get. And, um, <laughs> and I, it would the constraint of living in this one place and writing only in this place and feeling all the, the sense of, you know, black, which is what Eros means, right? Black. Hmm. Um, so it had to take place then, and it had to have that psychic force field of that, that feeling. Um, so I didn't know how it would turn out. I didn't go in with a plan. Um, I was just on, on the hunt for metaphors as I was living and walking all around Brooklyn. And so even the hex hexagonal tiles everywhere and on the footpaths and in the subways began to take on significance and, um, and reminded me of the Alhambra with all its tile and all the mathematical, mystical mathematical um, lore behind it. So it, it seemed to me I was trying to build a kind of Alhambra, of, you know, in a poem mm. that, that was mathematical, but it wasn't regular and of course Merrill's poem too didn't have wasn't all quad trains all the way through it's, it's studded with with um in, internal sonnets and you know triplet tercets and mm. you know going tacking back and forth between different forms so I was aware that I could do that and that was fine I would you know that that gave me license to do that myself mm. Mm. Let, let's hear another sh a very sh that short, very, very short section. Oh, bay, the next section. Um, I would like to, if we had time, we'd do the letter section as well, but let's just do the very short oh, bay section. Um, okay. Oh, bad. Oh, bad. You, my lucky lent one, the sky just restored to blue, has in it a ghostly stone blunted to a pearl like lumen I have hunted, if not to possess then construe as my call to Brighton. Hmm. Can I read that again? Yes, yeah, it'd be good to hear that again, yeah. Oh, God. You, my luculent one, 
The sky, just restored to blue, has in it a ghostly stone blunted to a pearl-like lumen I have hunted, if not to possess, then construe as my call to brighten. Hmm. I thought that was beautifully poised, that, that very short poem. It just, it just sort of hovers there, doesn't it? Um, another question I wanted to ask you about this, and then we, we better st start to wind up, but you know, at, at one point, I can't remember which section you say, nothing is an accident in love or literature, which felt almost like a statement for your work as a whole, finding, you know, like those hexagonal tiles, um, find, you know, even the difficulty seems to me to be trying to find the meaning of, I don't think the meaning of life sounds too grand, but the poetry of life, the, there's something valuable going on here, if you could but, you know, find it. Well, I, I was reading the rereading the uh, short stories of Henry James, the Aspirin Papers, and Figure mm. in the Carpet, and I think I think James was a big influence on this book as well, mm. and you know his ideas of, of figure in the carpet and the, mm. the hidden design. Mm. In the mm. So perhaps we better um, start to wind up, uh, but I'd like to. I thought we'd finish with this poem. A horse does not want to be FedExed, um, which, you know, one would love just for its title. Um, you know, again, for me, as I said, get, chimes with that wonderful title by Marianne Moore. Um, but let, yes, let's, let's hear, hear that poem. Okay. A horse does not want to be FedExed. Beauty is a fight to the finish, though you want to educate the decorum away. Here in the bruised atmosphere of a tropical storm, we wait for the rain band to diminish, considering horses. Your student had one shipped from Holland. A horse does not want to be FedExed. Could one apply dressage to text, have it perform at one's command, banish felicitous accident? You have to be a perfectionist, she had noted. Discipline is stylish but there's a grace by which your hands displace the eye of the storm within the encirclement of my wrist. And how say that, much less transmit it. Along the coast, the tempest is elegant, like something bred for show jumping across state lines, almost no really, over distress. The scent of a broken twig increasing a hundredfold the perfume of a living limb exhaling at the jagged enjambment its last. All told, the damage caused is as big as that of any grown tree, striking the edge of the roof, bouncing on the fence, tripping off calls to insurance, prayers to limbs still aloof, and recognition of mercy. A fight to the finish, sunlight on the garden, rain lacquered, hurricane groomed, the roses gave a start and bloomed like silly. If we've acquired a taste for drama, an appetite for tropical depression follows. And so we clown. I saw the fresh wood up. It awes me to see the parasites and moss studying the victor's crown that brought down the house. <laughs> That's just, I mean, I, I, I think of this as a virtuoso poem. Um, I don't know how you managed it. Uh, the, the beautiful pearl-like rhyme, um, where it's rhyming from the outside in, um, it's a beautiful form that, isn't it, which I've never even tried <laughs> to have a go at. Uh, Merrill does it famously in The Pearls, isn't he, where the whole poem rhymes to the central couplet, um, The Grit in the Pearl, which is... I love that poem. Yeah, unbelievably clever and funny and deep and everything, you know. Um, but yes, I... This, this, this thing you say, discipline is, is stylish, could be your strap line. <laughs> you know, if, if poets were to have strap lines, yours would be discipline is stylish, I think, because that's what I see so much in your work is this discipline is stylish. Um, but yes, it, it, this seems to me, again, a divorce poem to me. You, 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 you quote McNeese's famous div divorce poem, Sunlight on the Garden. Is that, is that how you see it? Yes. 
Yes, yes, it brought down the house, the storm that brought down the house. Mm. Strangely exuberant, though, for a divorce. Yes, <laughs> yes that's right. <laughs> I hope that everyone's divorce is as exuberant as this. <laughs> So look, we better uh, draw this well, to there's, a, there's a Uber. Go on. Go on. Carry on. You, you. Oh, I, I was, there, there's a, there's exuberance and destruction. I'm afraid. Mm, mm, yeah, mm. I, I think that's part of you know the the idea of the gods that there's mm. you know the gods are um, there's negativity as well as positivity and their construction and destruction. Mm, mm, indeed, indeed. So thank you uh, very, very much. Um, as you say in that poem, beauty is a fight to the finish. And uh, it really feels like that's, again, that could be a, you know, a good way. If I, you know, if one was to write a, a book about your work, you know, you might call it beauty is a fight to the finish, because it seems to me that that's so much what, what your poems are. There's a works of beauty. Um, I still want to value beauty very, very much. Um, I can't quite see the point of poetry without it. Um, I don't like to be improved by poems. I don't like to be lectured by poems, uh, but I do like to experience beauty. And I, I, I see that again and again in these poems. I've, you know, I've, I've been positively raving about them um, to, my, to my friends here at the London Buddhist Centre. So thank you very much for coming to Poetry East. So um, those of you watching, um, do um, will in the in the blurb underneath this um, video, there's a link that takes you to the um, mailing list for Poetry East. Um, Poetry East mostly is an in-person event here at the London Buddhist Centre. Um, so, for instance, next year as an in-person event, we've got um, the painter Christopher Lebrun, uh, Sir Christopher Lebrun, as it happens. Um, and but our next in, uh, online event, so we're doing more and more online only events, is going to be the novelist uh, Alexander McCall Smith, whose, uh, uh, whose novels have sold 30 million copies. If only poetry could sell like that. Um, but so I'll be talking to him about his, his writing. And he's also just produced a book of poems. So where he gets the time to do that, as well as write all those novels, I don't know. But I want to finish just by thanking you very much, Andrew. And, You've given me a lot of uh, joy reading this book. Um, I, I, I admit to being jealous. I'm admitting it here. <laughs> um, I, I, can, I can see how, well, I can't see because they're so, they're so light in the best sense, but I know how much work it takes to create that kind of lightness uh, and beauty. Um, so yeah, I would really want to thank you for the poem. Really great to be able to talk to you, albeit, um, remotely like this. Thank you for your kind words. Thanks for having me. Great, thank you. It was a pleasure. Good, good.